What's up everybody, I'm Renee Montgomery. I'm a former WNBA basketball player here in the US. I'm now part owner of the Atlanta Dream and it's always been my dream to perform at the highest possible level. That's something Aura Washington was denied. She too played my sport and she played tennis too. My word, did she play tennis. In fact, she was the Serena Williams of her day. In this podcast, Untold Legends, I'm telling her story. You can listen or watch here with me on YouTube. It's a very special tale, and I'm excited to bring it to you. Before we start, please note, this episode contains some outdated language that may offend. What does it mean to honor those who have gone before us? How should we pay tribute to those who break new paths for the rest of us? Thank you, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to tonight's program. And may I say what an honor it is to be in front of such an exceptionally elegant and well-appointed crowd tonight. March 29th, 1976. Across America, the Four Seasons are at the top of the charts with Oh, what a night. In California, a young software engineer called Steve Jobs is preparing to launch Apple computers. And in Washington, D.C., President Ford announces the first Black History Month to honor the too often neglected accomplishments of black Americans. And here in New York City, at a fancy downtown hotel, a unique award ceremony is being held in front of a specially invited audience dressed in their finest. And maybe it happened a little something like this. As you know, here at the Black Athletes Hall of Fame, we consider that we have a special duty, particularly to those in our community who have not been adequately recognized in the past. Up on the stage, retired Olympic long jumper Charlie Mays, dapper, sharp-suited, introduces the year's new Hall of Fame inductees. And I say this with pride. They are an incredible group of stars. Black athletes who deserve special recognition for their achievements. Some previous Hall of Famers you might have heard of, names like Muhammad Ali, Sugar Ray Robinson, Joe Lewis. But this part of the ceremony is different. This is not for your superstars and celebrities. And when it comes to recognizing some names, we consider we have a special challenge. Different because, for the first time, where an inductee would normally sit up on the podium, there's an empty chair on the stage. And we did have a very special challenge with this award, I have to tell you. We don't even know if this great black athlete even knows we are gathered here to honor her. And that empty chair has a simple label on it, Miss Aura Washington. But I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, Miss Washington is most certainly deserving of your respect and adulation. And if she is out there, we would most dearly like to let her take her rightful seat in this Hall of Fame. There's a reason Aura never showed up on this night in 1976. What no one in this room knows is that the great Miss Aura Washington has already been dead for five years. From BBC Sounds and the BBC World Service, This is Untold Legends Aura. I'm Renee Montgomery, former pro basketball player, now co-owner of the Atlanta Dream women's basketball team. In this series, I'm exploring the story of one of the most extraordinary black female athletes of the 20th century. A lost genius of both tennis and basketball. Someone you've most likely never heard of and whose story says a lot about how our world has and hasn't changed. And also, one hell of a woman. Her greatness hasn't been recognized as it should be. The mighty Aura Washington. She was the Michael Jordan of women's basketball. She was a tennis champion. But this isn't just the story of one exceptional woman. It's also the story of generations of struggle and sheer grit. Sports was a place to demonstrate 
how black folks were fit for citizenship. And how did one of the greatest black sports stars of history, the Serena Williams of her day, all but disappear from history? The reason is racism and sexism, right? There's a whole story here that, that needs to be told. Episode one, An Empty Chair. When I first heard about this story, so many of its elements rang true to my own experience and many other athletes I know, even now. As the co-owner of a basketball team and a former player myself, I've seen many times how sport changes lives positively, how it can uplift, how it can help people reach their real potential. And not just in terms of high scores and games won, I can tell you what you do on the court or on the pitch or the field it can change the rest of your life for the better. It's also a story about something that's so close to my heart, the power of family, black families in particular. In Orr's story, family comes up again and again, a source of strength and pride, a power that can carry people through both the highs and the lows. And there are obstacles along the way, oppression from many directions, race, gender, sexuality, wealth, social class, the whole spectrum. The same types of injustice which so many of us are still fighting today. As we enter Aura's world, even to begin to try and unravel the mystery around her, I know I'm going to face a few challenges. We will probably never know some of the specifics of her story. That's Karen Given, sports writer and one of the people who's dug deepest into Aura's life. She's part of a group of journalists and historians that I think of as the Aura Squad, an inner circle of Aura archaeologists, people who have devoted years to uncovering this mystery. We'll be hearing from a lot of them. And I think that's important to acknowledge. It's not an accident that these things weren't written down and that people weren't paying enough attention to her. It's a product of the times and a product of our society. The more I learned about her, just the more amazed I became. And that's another member of the inner circle, historian Pamela Grundy. She had no models for African-American female stardom. There just weren't models. So the timeline. We're talking a century before Serena and Venus Williams, or Naomi Osaka in tennis. Generations before LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, or Michael Jordan in basketball. A time when every sport, like so much in the U.S., was officially segregated by race. When tennis first comes to the U.S., it is very much an upper, upper class sport, and it's played in country clubs by very wealthy people. And they do not allow African-Americans to be part of that. They're excluded from the white institutions. To understand a little more about the choices and challenges Aura faced through her life, you need to know the world that she came from. In fact, this is a story that starts way back sometime around the very end of the 19th century. Sometime around, because that's another thing we can't be sure of. She was born 1898, 1899, I think, because nobody born in Virginia at that time has an official birth certificate. Also, particularly for African Americans, there's a lot of births at home. Little Aura may not have a birth certificate, but she does show up in the United States Census for 1900. I've got a copy of that particular page on the screen in front of me right now. Rows and rows of dense handwritten ink listing the age, race, and sex of every resident of this corner of the South. And she's here at line 35 of Supervisors District 195, sheet 10 of Caroline County, Virginia, or Washington, daughter, age two, although the two has been crossed through and rewritten. Was the guy they sent not entirely certain? And Aura's family, she's listed as one of six children. Brothers and sisters Vernon, Flora, Lee, Georgia, and Alyssi. Another brother and sister would come later. The parents are listed as James Thomas Washington and Laura Young Washington, 34 and 32 years of age, married 11 years. And under race or color, next to all their names, there's a single capital B for black. 
The first thing you have to understand, of course, is that African-American experiences in the South and the country in general vary a tremendous amount depending on where you are and to some degree who your family is. Ora's family lives in a farming area of Virginia called Caroline County, not far from the state capital of Richmond. It so happens Caroline County, it's kind of a hilly region. It's not plantation country. It's more hilly and so smaller farms. And this happens to be a place where there was economic opportunity for black families following the Civil War. Plantation country. Those areas where black Americans continue to work as sharecroppers on white people's land, picking cotton or tobacco in brutal conditions. But the Washington's family situation is a little different. The economic opportunity of the U.S. Civil War was this. The war had brought railroads through Caroline County and created chances for work outside the plantations. We don't know for sure if this is how Orr's parents or grandparents came to be in the area, but we do know that they have built up some economic independence by the standards of the day. They own their own farm, grow their own food, don't have to work as sharecroppers. My sense is that it was a pretty happy place. There was a big family, but they're working for themselves. It seems to have been a, a very close family. So I'm sure there was a lot of hard work, but it seems like there were good times as well. The closest link we have now to those days is an interview that Pamela recorded with Ora's nephew, J.B. Childs, who still lived in the area. Sadly, he died in 2014. I know my grandfather had a pretty big farm, and he had two or three horses. I know my grandfather had the farm, and he had two or three horses. Because the sound quality on the recording isn't great, we've got an actor to read his words. They grew tobacco, corn wheat, rye, and all sorts of vegetables. Tobacco was the biggest money strike. They raise tobacco and sell it in the winter, always have some for Christmas, whoever needed it. That's the way they made a living. The oldest children were born on that farm. They were raised there. When Aunt Ora would come home for vacation, she would stay with her father. We were one of the better off families, but most of the families own their farms. But make no mistake, this is not luxury. Kids would have been expected to pull their weight. Given that Ora liked to play sports, had remarkable gifts, my guess would be she probably helped with the farm work. And even the better off black families of Caroline County who don't have to work as sharecroppers can't shield themselves from other realities of life in the South. As residents of Virginia, the Washingtons live under formal legal segregation by race. The web of laws to ensure that they remain as second class citizens at every stage of their lives. If you've heard of Jim Crow, you'll know what I'm talking about. Some examples, the same year as Little Aura first appears in the census, Virginia passes a law forcing railroad companies to provide separate cars for black and white riders. Another law does the same for steamboat passengers. Schools are also separate, but not equal. Then there's a further push happening to restrict black Americans' political rights, the disfranchisement movement. In Virginia, the disfranchisement movement, which sweeps the South 1890s up into 1900, people are losing the right to vote. So it's just getting tougher for African-Americans across the South. My own family has its roots not too far from Aura's. My mom's grandma was born just a couple of years after Aura in the neighboring state of West Virginia, also a farming area, also under Jim Crow. Okay, this is just so, so interesting. Stories get passed down through families about those times. Here's my snook. That's our name for my mom. My grandmother was born in 1901 in Rustburg, Virginia, and her family owned a tobacco farm there, and they were independent, and they raised crops and everything. My grandmother uh, was the oldest of her five or six siblings. The only difference so far is that Aura was a middle child, not the eldest. We used to call our great-grandma Fanny Pearl. That's the woman Snook is remembering. And she quit school in the fourth grade to help with the farm work. 
That's just nine or 10 years old. Again, we think Aura wasn't able to stay in school long either, probably a similar age, though she did learn to read and write. In our family, the reason to leave school was simple, pure necessity. So it was more important for her to get out there. She was the cook for the family and the person who took care of the kids while the parents and others were out in the fields working. Stories get passed down through families about those times in the South. There's no question in my mind that Aura would have recognized a lot of what Snook's grandma said about those days. I don't want to uh, blast any particular area or whatever, but she said the reason that she left Virginia was because of the racism. It was just a very, very racist area that she lived in in Virginia. Daily life was lived by openly racist rules. In other words, if there was a water fountain, you know which one to use, a bathroom, you knew which one to use. Just a different way of life, a more subservient type of existence in those communities. If you were spoken to and told to do something by a member of the white race, you were expected to do that without any questions, hesitation. Because asking too many questions could cause trouble. Where the stories were like stay in your place stories, not where there was violence or anything, but there were incidences where her brothers, sisters, family members were reminded that they needed to stay in their place. Stay in your place. We have a family story that sums all that up. It's from when great grandma was a little older, an adult, and traveling through a different part of the Jim Crow South the state of North Carolina, and she gets thirsty. I guess back in the day, they had the little hometown stores or convenience stores where you could go get a soda. Some. So she had went to the store and she went to the machine and got a Coke and you know, Coke used to be in the bottle and you had to have the lid. So she didn't know any of the customs, I guess, or rules more so that were in this particular part of the country. So she went and got the Coke and opened it and set it on the counter to pay for it. It's a white store and the clerk behind the counter said, you know, we don't sell Cokes to Negroes here. <laughs> and so my grandmother, being the firebird that she was, she picked it up and drank out of it and said, oh, okay, and set it back on the counter and left. All of the blacks that were with her were just appalled because they said, are oh, you gonna bring trouble on us? <laughs> <laughs> because you did that, but you know, that was my grandmother. So because of all of this, when I try to imagine Orr's life at this time, I know we aren't just talking about strict legal discrimination. It goes deeper than that. We're talking about a whole culture of fear, touching every part of normal life. Stay in your place. You'll bring trouble on us. Fears that are well-founded. Okay, here's an example. It's the fall of 1916, and one of Virginia's daily papers for white folks, the Charlottesville Daily Progress, has a fun piece on the front page. November 1st, 1916. Halloween is duly observed. So this sounds like a good time, right? You can read all about last night's Halloween costume parties, parades, street festivals, that kind of thing. The streets of the city wore a carnival aspect last night. It was Halloween Eve and the juvenile population was allowed to have sway. And you know, it wouldn't be Halloween without people dressing a bit spooky. Goblins and hobgoblins, spooks and sprites emerged from the dark recesses. Main Street was a sight to behold. But halfway through, there's a short note about another group who joined the party. In the midst of all, a gay battalion of the Ku Klux Klan came thundering down from the heights of Midway recalling other days. Many a dusky denizen of the bottom was seen to shrink instinctively back into the shadows as they swept along. If it's not clear, those dusky denizens shrinking instinctively? Yeah, they're just ordinary black Virginians on the streets of Charlottesville.
And part of that culture is to prevent or discourage black people from taking up any activity which is judged above their station. And that includes a gentleman's sport like tennis. And it doesn't just apply to the Jim Crow South. In Baltimore, there was a tennis court that everybody in Baltimore used at different times. And for years, this was the case. This is Dr. Amir Rose Davis of Penn State University, a specialist in black sports history. And then the park board in 1905 was like, actually, we don't like this. Like, we need to make these segregated tennis courts and build a black tennis court somewhere else up by the pig pen in the mud because actually this is a little too close for comfort. A little too close to equality between the races. And so you see by 1910 that it has become segregated in how they allocate their times on the courts. That incident is typical, according to Dr. Rose Davis. And this is all happening when Aura's a young child. Things are actually getting worse as she grows up. Segregation starts seeping in. It starts hardening. That color line starts becoming enforced, right? Setting in to become law after a moment of like a little bit more fluidity. But in this era, there are some institutions providing a space for Black people to develop their talents in sport, including tennis, even for women. When you see the early opportunities come up for Black girls and women, they're in Black high schools and Black colleges. And these are robust athletic opportunities involving multiple sports. Around the time of Orr's birth, the first interclub matches between Black tennis clubs across the country are beginning to be held. Many of these clubs are based in Black colleges and only open to college members, limited to the upper-class elite of Black America. But a few black tennis clubs are open to any black person with the interest and dedication to learn. As we'll hear, some of these places even encourage women to take up the sport. A place like this will one day change Aura's life. And so part of what we have in the era of Jim Crow are these robust black institutions on the other side of the color line that was created to sustain folks during Jim Crow. A survival strategy, a place of refuge. And I think that's kind of one of the things that you do see happening is the pressure to be great because you have to be so good that they can't deny you an athletic spot at wherever you're kind of competing. At this time, basketball, my game, has a different image than tennis. Basketball is a new game invented in the 1890s, just a few years before Aura's birth. And a North American one first played in Massachusetts. It doesn't come with so much of the old world country club baggage of tennis. And black people take to it quickly. Young women play basketball. New York Age, March 3rd, 1910. The first record of a basketball match between two teams of black women appears in 1910. The New York Age, a black newspaper, could hardly believe it. Last Saturday, a pleasing innovation was introduced to a delighted audience. Members of the fairer sex participated in a basketball contest. The players... Winsome and charming in their dainty white blouses, demonstrated that they can play. By the 1910s, when Aura is a teenager, black women's teams are springing up all over the country. And for our story, these teams are crucial. They're like an experimental laboratory, developing the tactics, strategies, and skills needed to excel at this strange new game. And they create a foundation of knowledge to pass on to the next generation, Aura's generation and ultimately to players like me, our foremothers wearing their dainty white blouses or not. But Orr's family are struggling for other reasons. In 1910, the census man pays another visit to the farm, 10 years on from his last. This time, Orr is listed as 12 years old and her younger brother and sister appear as well, but one name is missing. For the first time, Orr's mother, Laura, isn't on the list of family members. Orr's father has a new letter next to his name on the census, a W for widow. Her mother dies in childbirth. Pamela Grundy's been trying to trace what happened to Orr around this time. So my guess would be that as she got older, she was dealing with a more difficult era. Maybe it's obvious, but that's the kind of thing that is going to mark you for life. The kind of tragedy that changes a person particularly someone so young. 
Later on, we'll hear about the legendary willpower and resilience of young Aura and about her love of family and family life, her closeness to those that remained. For much of her adult life, Aura actually shares a building with her brothers, sisters, cousins, nephews. For me, that side of her life, some of her grit, it's gotta come back to losing her mother at such a young age. And in 1910, the census taker did record a new name at the farm, Isabella Washington, or as a grandma, 70 years old. My feeling is she probably moves in to help dad care for these eight motherless kids. And after the family tragedy, there also seems to be money problems. It's getting more difficult. I believe the farm is mortgaged that year. You see in the census. So there's been some economic difficulties with crops and money. When I picture little 12-year-old Aura on that census day in 1910, living at the farm with dad and grandma and her brothers and sisters with money short, I know this had to be hard times. And that's why I think what happens next begins to make a lot of sense. A future for Aura in Virginia is getting less and less likely. Obviously, if you've got children and a small farm, you can't divide it up. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So I think it would be difficult to perpetuate a farming life for everyone, even if you own that land. And so that's also part of the reason why people would go north. Go north. Of course, Aura is not alone. This is a mass movement taking place across the first quarter of the 20th century, a movement in American history that changed a nation. In groups small and large, Black American people are leaving the South and heading for the cities and jobs of the North. New York, Chicago, Detroit, Philadelphia, and many other cities, what historians call the Great Migration. Oh, it's definitely part of the Great Migration, but it's a long, ongoing process that kind of ebbs and flows based on the conditions at home and the opportunities in the city. So she's definitely right in the Great Migration. And I think the way it happens is quite typical that one family member goes and establishes themselves and then brings other family members. In this case, Family history states that Orr's Aunt Maddie was the pioneer. Some enterprising person sets out, and then once they've kind of figured out what's going on, then other people come. And I think it's clear Orr's Aunt Maddie, she was the first one to go, and she got married, and she established herself, and then other relatives started to come, uh, and Orr was one of those. So, we can't be sure when, but sometime in the 1910s, a teenage Aura packs her bags and leaves the old farm and the South for good. She takes the train a few hours north to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to join Aunt Maddie. She doesn't know it yet, but as she steps off that train at Broad Street Station into the big city for the first time and into a new life, she's entering a world with very different opportunities and dangers. Opportunities that previous generations of women, and particularly black women, have never had within their grasp, including unfeminine activities like sport. And as for the dangers, well, Philadelphia isn't the safest place either. Next time, we'll be hearing about those dangers. Philadelphia is a very racist place. There's just no bones about it. Philadelphia was very racist. And hearing how a farm girl from Caroline County, Virginia, conquers the gentleman's game of tennis. This whole notion that women are pure and they're pious and they're submissive and they're domesticated and how dare women want to play these physical sports. Yeah, how dare they? From BBC Sounds and the BBC World Service, this is episode one of seven of Untold Legends Aura. Untold Legends is a Stance Studios production for BBC Sounds and the BBC World Service. And I'm your host, Renee Montgomery. Our cast were Cameron Williams, Alex James, and Ken Foster. I hope you've enjoyed the first episode. I'm so excited for you to hear the others, and I'd love to hear what you think. So please leave a rating and a review where you get your podcast. It really does make a difference and it helps others find the podcast. 
And before I let you go, please also subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes.